Hello and welcome to another Build a Soil YouTube FAQ video. Today we've got season six FAQ eight and we're rounding up season six right now. Probably gonna harvest the four by four here tomorrow. And then I'm gonna go over nug shots and discussing some of the, the qualities, smoke report, and then eventually the yield report. So all of that's coming down the pipe. For right now, it's FAQ 8, so let's do as usual where I've got the questions in my hand. I'm just going to jump in and let's see what I can do. Okay, Jose. First question. Jose says, huge fan of Build-A-Soil. I have a Synganic question. All right, we'll see what I can do. Okay, the question is, I was recently browsing the site and seeing the Big 6 plus humic acid and says that you could use this hydroponically. Was thinking of adding this to my base formulas by crop salt because I've seen that it could help plants develop resistance towards disease and can also help yield. Let me know what you th uh, might think about using these together. Not an organic grower yet, but I still take my time to watch most of your videos and learn about it. First off, thank you for, for asking a question. Even though you're a synganic grower, I'd like to see more people transitioning or trying to come to the build a soil way. And f for how much we invest in growing, for a lot of us, it's not just easy as throwing away our entire old system and jumping into something new. However, I wish everyone would just fully convert. I'm happy to help you answer these questions. So. The big thing with the big six humic acid is that the humic acid we use from Faust comes in a little bit chunky. And part of that is originally from Dr. Faust, keeping it as raw as possible. And he's using the humic acid more as a carrier for the micronutrients and a chelation agent. And one of the things that he recommended for like berry producers and for larger farms when they're using a drip irrigation system was to make a hot water extract with the big six. Essentially you take clean water, you do a hot water solution, you shake it, you let it settle. Once it's completely settled, you pour the hot water liquid off the top and you let that cool and that can be your new big six formulation that would work well in hydroponics. Other than that, I'm not sure the chunky size, how you could use it in hydroponics without clogging something, without making the hot water extraction. Beyond that, I will say, most of the positives that I've seen with humic acid, when they, when they make claims like fulvic or humic, I know Dr. Faust would say, you could reduce your nutrients by half, things like this. Most all of those studies came from hydroponic where the humic made a big difference, where in soil, we already have humic if we're using good compost or adding the humic is beneficial, but may not see the same difference as in hydro. So I think I can encourage you to try it, but I'm hesitant because I'm not a hydro grower and I don't want to mess up your system. If you are hydroponically growing as far as potentially like soilless and you're just watering into a media, then using big six with your crop salts could potentially be a really good idea. I've seen a couple of growers tag us using crop salt and build a soil, and it looks like they had great results. It's not my style, but I still appreciate the question. Uh, Jinx, regarding build a veg, I thought it was interesting that calcium was included as I thought that sometimes it was a negative to add calcium via irrigation into balanced soil. So calcium is the number one most heavy. And so we added small amounts of it into the build a veg because a lot of times what happens when you start to boost a feed, and I wouldn't say you need to do this unless you're boosting because the soil should be balanced. But when we're boosting, we're adding something that's water soluble. A lot of times what I'd like to do is boost the other things that are important along with it. So whatever's water soluble is consumed in balance as opposed to just boosting one area and then having the soil do the rest. So the idea is that like, for instance, when you go to the hydro store and you're using an older model of like A and B and bloom boosters, a lot of times the additional boosting of the PK would cause you to need more calcium and magnesium. And it's almost like the two products would support each other. When it comes to veg, that's one of the things that I see as important is keeping the availability of calcium high. And we didn't saturate it in the build of veg, but it was an important component to me. Across the board, when you look at soil testing, we wanna see calcium at the higher level. So that was my personal opinion. That's how I make the products. We've seen really good results using it. The other thing with build of veg is a lot of times when I'm using a product, we're talking a half teaspoon, a teaspoon, we're not adding a lot, but it can make a significant difference by adding the calcium when we're talking about keeping a healthy plant alive longer in a small container. So for instance, if you've got like clones in a cup and you're like, ah, I really wanna transplant those, but it's gonna have to be next week. I've got a lot going on this weekend. Build a veg would be a great place to go. Liquid fish works really well, but it can have a little bit of like negative sodium buildup so you could alternate. I was looking for the tool for me when I made build a veg to complement something that could keep a plant stronger longer or maybe turn the health around and that needed more than just the nitrogen profile or just the NPK type profile. And so that's why we did it. So thank you for asking. Doctor says, are the Hallisons and the four x four receiving the same DLI as the 10 by 10 plants were? 
No, a little bit warmer in there, didn't have the same environmental control, so they're at a lower DLI, and that's because of the lower PPFD. They were on the same 12 hours, and then they got dropped to the same 11 hours, so similar length of time, a little bit lower PPFD based on the intensity in the tent with the heat and a few other parameters. Sometimes I do that in a smaller tent. I'll just lower things a little bit to make it slightly easier for myself. Okay, Sam, thank you for the invaluable series. You're welcome, let me take a sip. I swear this is my coffee from this morning, but if I don't have anything to drink, then I can barely talk halfway through this thing. A little cold, but still good. Okay, Sam, thank you for the invaluable series. You're welcome. I currently have six autoflower plants going, four and five gallon and two and seven gallon. I would like to increase my pot size and stick with no-till living soil, but I'm curious about the effect of combining my multiple containers after one grow into a larger container. Any thoughts or advice? Do it, it'll totally work. I understand your fear. A lot of times when we're not sure what we're not sure about, we have lots of extra questions because we just don't wanna do something stupid without knowing. And so if you've got containers, it sounds like six of them, four or five gallons and two and seven gallons. So that's 20 and 14, so that's 34 gallons of soil, roughly, call it 30, you might not have them completely full. And you wanna get into a bigger container, I would absolutely mix that into a larger container, Rubbermaid tubs, on a tarp, whatever you want. You could re-amend it just a little bit to boost the fertility across the board, maybe some craft blend or a re-amend kit. And then you could just start off as per usual in your new larger container. And typically in larger containers, I get larger results. Either I get easier results because I flip the flower right away or I get larger. With autoflowers, a lot of times, the number one problem with autoflower is stunting. And if you can get a good germination and an immediate transplant or a straight germination in a large container, you get big yields off the autoflowers. So I think it's a really, really good idea for you. So that's my advice. The other thing is, I wouldn't worry about this too much. Like when you're mixing soil up from an old container to a new, one of the things that we can do is just get an idea of texture. Did it feel like it needed a little more aeration? Was it extra broken down? Was it solid worm castings full of worms? You can certainly affect the texture by adding a few things, maybe some more drainage. You can add a little more peat moss, a little more compost. But for the most part, I'm very comfortable dumping those containers, re-amending lightly. And so if you look at our re-amend kits, there's a number of different considerations. The old recipes were always one and a half cups to two cups of nutrients per cubic foot and four cups of minerals. And when we re-amend, we usually do like half that. So grab your favorite amendment and add a cup per cubic foot and you should be good to go. You can add minerals this time, but since it was your first round, you could always top dress those later. I doubt they're depleted. So again, good question. Everybody who has a question has a good question. <laughs> All right, let's see. OG Steve, could you share your thoughts about this? Scientists have proven the existence of this flower inducing hormone or hormone-like molecule linked to the process of photoperiodism. It's called Florigen. Its mechanism is still a mystery. I love stuff like this. There's tons of stuff in the human body that they're just researching now at like the tip of the spear for medical research and the possibilities are endless. It's fascinating. So um, for the record, I don't know much about Florigen, but let's keep going. It was shown that grafting a leaf taken from a flowering plant onto a non-flowering plant was enough to induce flowering in the latter despite being kept in a non-flowering light cycle. Efforts to isolate and identify this molecule are ongoing, but it can theoretically be of great use to cannabis growers, potentially enabling photoperiod independent flowering and non-autogenetics. Fascinating. Just talking about it is exciting. I don't have any answers for you. I'll share with you when my brain goes just reading this, right? Immediately upon reading this, I was thinking that last sentence I was already like coming up with. I was thinking, well, it sounds like what you're doing is you're saying that if the photoperiodism is a switch, when you look into it, for those that don't know, the way they have flowers always ready for say Mother's Day is they use this photo, like this, this photoreceptor switch, photoperiodism, and they interrupt it. And so you can look into like the gas lantern lighting technique and some weird things that play with that. But when you're um, growing, let's say flowers, and you don't want them to trigger to flower, what you can do is interrupt their night with a small amount of light. And that will trick the phytochrome, basically like a switch, triggering it back to keep vegetative growth. Once the photoperiodism related to the amount of hours in the day, it's switched, switched to flower, they start flowering. And so what they do is they interrupt the night, they interrupt the night, and then as they get closer to Mother's Day, they stop the interruption and they let the phytochrome switch and it goes into flower. So what you're saying by this postulation is it sounds like this florigen is the result of that. So maybe the hours of light don't control flowering. They control the photoperiod switch 
that activates the fluorogen that triggers the flowering. And if that's the case, then it sounds like we may not need the switch. We just induce the fluorogen. I'm hesitant to fuck with mother nature when it comes to the order of operations and think that we can get a win. A lot of times it's isolated and it's not as good as we think. And when we look at the full picture, it's better just to utilize nature. But it sounds like maybe autoflowers are using fluorogen released at maturity instead of from a photo period switch, which would be very similar to what you could affect if you could affect this in regular genetics. So fascinating, but I literally have no clue how possible it may be or if it could be bad or good. But um, something tells me I'll be Googling a little bit more about that after this. So for what it's worth, thanks OG Steve. Chad884, could you run a compost tea through the Blue Mat Reservoir? All right, I know people have done this and it's, I don't think it's more about could you, it's more about should you. And so you're gonna get some clogging at some point, you're gonna get biological buildup. We're brewing a biologically active tea and we're running it through. So let's say you knew that your reservoir was pretty small and that it was gonna run through fairly quickly and you immediately let it run through and then you cleaned it all and then you purge your lines and you put it back together. I think it's more trouble than, than it's worth. I think it'd be better to set your blue mats slightly higher on the numbers so it's slightly drier and you can come in and supplement teas whenever you want or regular water on top of the blue mat whenever you want and then it would be right in the soil system. The other thing is when you're using the blue mat, it's not just about the reservoir, which can get dirty. It's about the lines going through the blue mat carrot or through the sensor into maybe your drip ring or into your drip tape. The drip tape, if it gets a bust at the seam from pressure or if anything happens over time, it can grow algae inside and all sorts of stuff clogging those little micro pores. So my recommendation is to avoid doing anything other than clean water through your blue mat reservoirs. I think it's just gonna make more sense to keep it with clean water. And then, then you'll have a solid plan for alternating as far as giving it compost tea or adjusting your blue mat down when you feed or keeping it down the whole time. I think that, that would be the better way to go and that's my suggestion. However, I do think it's possible. So those are, you know, like you could get away with it probably. So those are just different answers. Southern Solvent List. Hey Jeremy, much love as always. Would love to hear you talk about the move away from carrying single ingredients. Some of us have noticed things like oyster shell flour, for example, isn't available anymore. Could you elaborate on this some? Thanks as always. Southern Solventless, yes. I actually really appreciate the behind the scenes business type questions because it's difficult to communicate clearly to every single person about all the little things behind the scenes and something I've noticed in life. When you don't talk about things, people make up the answers. And I'm not saying you are, but I feel like I'd rather just tell you what's going on. So in particular with oyster shell flour, the uh, manufacturer that we buy truckloads from actually reached out to us and said, hey, don't pack small amounts of oyster shell flour anymore. We don't want you doing it. And we've been doing it for a decade. So it's so strange to me, but we decided to honor them and just do that. Now, they're not the only supplier. We've purchased from many suppliers. So we're considering just getting a truckload from elsewhere and then continuing to rebag that single ingredient. The other thing that we have done, which helped us sidestep that just a little bit is instead of selling a single ingredient, we did make a calcium blend. We just released it. You can go check it out. It's called multi-cal. And the reason behind this is phenomenal in the sense that a lot of times we're buying the oyster because we want the calcium carbonate. Usually we're balancing that with gypsum or something else and overdoing the calcium carbonate can be a problem. So we created the multi-cal. It's got a calcium montmorillonite, really rare, hard to get. It's got wollastonite, calcium silicate, it's got calcium um, phosphate, it's got calcium sulfate, it's got the calcium carbonate from the oyster. I think that might be a really good way to go and I know we can keep doing that in small amounts since it's a blend. Otherwise, I hope to bring oyster shell uh, flour back, we'll let you know. One of the other ones, um, if you notice any other ones, some of the reasons behind the scene is, you'll, if you've been a long time customer, you'll know we were getting overwhelmed at certain parts of the year or even for long periods of time keeping up with orders. Behind the scenes is a small business managing the logistics of getting many, many different raw organic ingredients. And what we would always do is we'd sell the single ingredient and we'd also sell because we mixed with it. And sometimes we'd sell out of the single ingredient online when we had planned to build the next day, needing that raw ingredient. And so then we'd be out of stock waiting for another one to come into play. So until we got our shit right, we slowed down in a number of areas. And I'm really happy to report the biggest side effect of doing that is the employee morale is way up because we're not constantly behind. The team is crushing it right now. They're organized, they're getting builds done, they're ahead of schedule, we're in stock on most products. That's the intended result. And so now we can listen to the community and we can start to bring certain single ingredients back when it makes sense. Otherwise, just know, we're not just randomly pulling ingredients because we want to stop selling them. We're in the business of, of offering what you guys want. And so for sure, if there's something important, please reach out. When you ask us for stuff, 
Sometimes it's as simple as, man, it got turned off on the website and we had no clue. It uh, could have been something that basic, but the Oyster, there's a little more behind the scenes. So let's see, next one, waking up. Will you be making hash with the product that was early from this run? Um, more than likely, yes. I don't wanna make promises because documenting it becomes a little bit of a labor and I may actually not make hash out of it. Uh, when I was looking at the flower, the dog's breath was probably some of the one that was looked earlier, but man, it is good. I smoked a couple early samples of it and like, I'm really impressed. So I'm probably gonna be looking to that as some of my head stash. There was definitely some amber in there. I'm not too worried about it. So uh, good question. I'm, I'm considering for season seven, trying to document hash making like we did with Pedro, but low temp press. We've carried their presses. We've worked with them in the past. They reached out behind the scenes. We've been talking a little bit. There is a possibility for season seven, we could grow some sort of cut that's good for washing and then use their mini Osprey document an entire like home pro series uh, to complement our Pedro one. And I think that could be really, really fun. So why don't you guys comment on here um, about what you'd like to see for season seven? So, and I'll go through these comments and I'll see if there's any ideas because that's coming up soon. We have the 10 by 10 and the four by four, and I'm open to suggestions. Part of me wants to do less quadrants, higher plant count how I'd normally do, right? So I could really have a shorter veg. Part of me wants to do clones this time so we can get a little bit better like canopy. But honestly, I just wanna do what you want. So if you've got some good suggestions here, I'm totally open to it. So please drop them in here. Watkins, you gotta hand trim all that by yourself. What happens when you have that much plant material and it's dry, but it may take you a few days or even longer to trim. Are you worried about it getting over dried? Good question. Yes, I'm gonna hand trim it all, probably not all by myself, and I'm not gonna do the best job. Trimming is a little bit overrated when you grow a lot. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna be bucking it down, putting it in tubs. When I get home, I use a, I'll put it in an area of my house that's cooler, and by keeping it in the tubs, I can keep the humidity up. I can also put in like a fresh leaf, something with a little bit of moisture in it to raise the humidity in the tub just slightly. You can put like soak a little bit of a, of a paper towel, put it kind of in the corner, so that you get a little bit of humidity release. You can use the little miniature humidifier or humidistats to read the humidity within your tub, but realistically pulling it just slightly before it's ready in the jar. Like a lot of times on, at the end of drying, you get that stem snap, but some of the bigger ones still have a tiny bit of moisture. And so that buys me enough time by tubbing it down immediately, not leaving it hanging, and then putting those tubs right back in the dry room and leaving the humidifier on at 60%. At my house, I'll probably just put it in another room, turn the humidifier on to 60, leave it in the tubs. That will perpetually keep me in the position where I can grab a tub when I want and trim it and put it back without worry about it declining. Essentially, in the jar, it's gonna be around that humidity. So I'm just creating a bigger space that's just like the jar it's gonna be in. I still think getting it without the oxygen in there, a full jar, as fast as possible, tucked away, is the best way to go. So that's part of my other plan. Besides that, when I get the tubs out, I basically take the tops that have the easiest to trim nugs. I take all those off. I trim those with the trim brush and I make sure they look good and I knock all the nugs off. The rest gets stripped and I have bags of smalls and then um, anything that goes through, like the smallest trim stuff just gets to tossed into a trim bag. So I have like trim, smalls, and then my A's that I actually put a little bit of effort into. And I found that when I'm documenting the yield, it's better to document as much of that yield as possible and then just share the caveat that, hey, that's including the trim, the smalls, and the large flowers because each person's gonna be more selective. And so I could say, this is just the big flowers and I can include some lowers in that. Or I could say, this is just, just the big flowers and the smalls and exclude the trim. And I could trim barely just trying to inflate my yield numbers. So I like to generally talk about everything and keep it kind of conservative on the number as far as finished, finished nugs. And then in that way, I don't stress myself out so much in trying to trim every single nug because if you get super meticulous, it can take you hours and hours just to get through one pound. But when you go through and you've got a good system, like I will have a tub on my right, I'll have a tub in the middle, I'll have a tub on the left, I'll be able to actually like go through, strip, take my trim bin, put the good ones there, debuck everything like in one standing area. Then I can eventually take what I've bucked down and go through that in a few hours and go through all the pounds that quickly instead of doing it you know, so meticulously like I used to do when I first started. But the question about what do you do to keep it fresh, that's what I really wanted to make sure I honored. And so ideally, if you've got like a drying tent and a humidifier, keeping it at 60%, 58% or whatever towards the end there, tub it so that it's reducing the oxygen around it and the air around it and the airflow around it, volatizing your terps, 
put the lid on the tub, put it back in that same environment. And then, you know, that night or the next day, check and make sure it's not like re-moistening. You weren't a little early. If it's good in the tub, you're good in that environment for a while while you go to trim. In fact, a lot of home growers, when they grow outdoor, they pull 10 plus pounds and they just do not have the time. They follow this protocol. They keep an environment that's decent. And when they're ready for the next batch for themselves or whatever, they go grab that tub and trim it up even six, eight months later. So it may not be the most ideal way to do to go, but that's the process that's used. So, Danny, please do a four by four SOG from Clone on season seven. Okay, I'm open to suggestions. Danny wants to see a sea of green from Clones on season seven in the four by four. And that could be fun. I've got those 15 gallons from last time. We could just no-till and run it again. We could do more small containers. We could do tray to grow in there. We could do earth boxes, but either way, I could fill it with clones. I think that would be really, really fun to do. Man, I've got the, the, the one from Coot that he gifted to me that we're trying to share. We're taking clones. I could run some of that. There was the idea of getting some really famous cuts that have known uh, wash percentages on them and working with low temp. And if we did that, we would see like, hey, this average cut on a fresh frozen returns X percent. Can build a soil do better, the same or worse? Like maybe that would be fun, I don't know. So drop your ideas in here. Thank you so much for all the questions as usual. I really like doing these FAQs. And by the time we harvest the four x four and go over smoke report and everything, I'll probably have time for maybe one or two more FAQs. So if you've got just general questions, drop them in here as well. Otherwise, until next time, thank you so much. Like, subscribe, tell your friends about all of this and um, go to the new product section at build a soil. We've got, I think over 30 new products, which is really rare for us because those new products, they eliminate, they get removed from the list after 90 days. And this last quarter has been really active for us. So go check that out. I think there's some stuff that you'll really like. And we released a new theme on our website that has a lot more interactive function. And I think you'll like that too. So give me some feedback on that. Subscribe, like, tell your friends. And until next time, I'll see you on the next Build a Soil video.